Well, thank you very much. I consider it to be a real honor to be included in this terrific roster of really inspiring speakers. I hope that what I say doesn't in any way diminish the wonderful messages that we have heard. I'm here today to talk with you about debunking some myths that exist about leadership and about life. And I'll try to do that by presenting to you four fundamental concepts that I hope will be useful. The first myth that I think prevails in our society is that you help yourself and others by pointing out to them the things that they don't do well. And earlier speakers have <clears throat> commented on this idea, so I'm glad to be reinforcing what you've already heard. But that is really not a, a, a true principle. And I think one of the best illustrations of that uh, occurred a number of years ago in a little classroom in a Minnesota town by a teacher who had a new idea for a class. Uh, she was a junior high school mathematics teacher. And she came into class on this particular day and she said, we're going to have a little bit of a different class. I want each of you to take out three or four pieces of lined paper from your notebooks. I want you to copy down on those pieces of paper the names of all the students that I've written here on the board. They're in alphabetical order. And I want you to do that and do it as quickly and efficiently as you can. And so the students all kind of very dutifully got their papers out and they wrote down all these names. And she then said to them, now what I want you to do is to write down the thing that you most appreciate about that person, the thing that most resonates with you, how they've been helpful to you, what you consider to be their primary positive attributes. The students looked a little bit dazzled because this was certainly not what you would expect from a mathematics class in junior high school, but they proceeded to do that. She then said to them, when you finished, um, you may just put your paper on my desk and you're welcome to leave. This is Friday afternoon. So Monday came and uh, the students came back and she said, here's, a, here's your paper. And she had taken a sheet of paper for each student, had copied all of the comments that others had made about that student on this single piece of paper. And she proceeded to distribute them to all of the class members. There were obvious whispers and glances back and forth with people saying, oh, thank you, I didn't know you thought that about me. Uh, lots of smiles, lots of positive vibrations. After 20 minutes or so, she said, okay, time to get back to math, put your papers away, they're yours to keep. And they proceeded back to their regular mathematics curriculum. A number of years passed and uh, she, w she had retired and she was reading the newspaper one day and she saw in the, in the local paper an obituary. An obituary about a young man who had been in her class. His name was Mark Eklund. He'd been serving uh, in the army and was a victim of, of the war at the time. And it was, uh, the announcement included the, the date and time of his funeral. So when that day arrived, she decided that she would go. She remembered him very well. She went there to the funeral and uh, she stood by as the people who were in attendance kind of milled around the casket. And she proceeded to kind of say, well, uh, she, she wondered about, you know, will people make room for me as she came up to the casket. And she looked down inside and so then she quickly saw this handsome young man that she had been so fond of and so close to. Uh, what was fascinating was that as she stood there, the mother and father walked up. And the father reached in his pocket and pulled out a wallet and he said, by any chance, are you the, the junior high school mathematics teacher that Mark had? And she said, yes, I was. And he said, the army sent back to us his personal effects. And inside this wallet, there wasn't very much. There were a couple of photographs, but there was this piece of paper. And it was 
he reached inside, pulled it out. It was yellowed. It was tattered. It had been scotch taped. He said, was this, is this your writing? And she said, yes, it was. And they said, it appears that he carried that with him throughout his entire life since the time he was in your class. At the end of the funeral, a number of the students invited her to come to lunch with them. They went to a local cafeteria, and um, they began talking, and the, the topic of the conversation turned to these papers. Every, every person there commented that they had the, that piece of paper in scrapbooks, in their top desk drawer, in their dresser drawer, hanging on their mirror, everyone had saved that piece of paper. Now, I ask you to think for a moment, what if her assignment to the class many years ago had been, write down one developmental suggestion for this person. <laughs> <laughs> write down something you think he or she could really improve upon. Would they have, would they have cherished those pieces of paper the same way that they cherished this list of positive attributes. I tell you that story because I think it illustrates a very important principle that we've learned strongly in the field of leadership today, and that is that the effectiveness of leaders is not a function of their perfection, not the absence of any weaknesses or flaws, but we have an abundance of data, some data on about 75,000 leaders as assessed by nearly a million other respondents that says very clearly what you see before you. That a person with no real strengths is not very perceived as being a really effective leader. But a person with two or three or four strengths doesn't need to be 10 or 20 or 30, but three or four strengths catapult somebody up to a very high level of behavior and performance. The second myth I'd like to kind of talk with you about is that we are a product of our past. Uh, I talk with young people from time to time. We, I'm, uh, I'm 84 years of age. Luckily, I have a number of grandchildren. And uh, these wonderful grandchildren come and visit us periodically, and they bring their friends. And so we have some really fascinating conversations. On occasion, you'll, you'll meet somebody who, who feels or thinks that his life is on a trajectory from which he cannot depart because of his father's occupation or because of his circumstances or what classes he had taken or where he went to school or how he looks, that, you know, it's just, it's all, it's all predetermined. It reminds me very much of a story that was told to me by Jim Clemmer, one of our very good colleagues up in, uh, up in Canada. Jim tells this story about a young man who grew up in a, in a small town. He left town to go away to college and then to graduate school. He came back a number of years later, and he, he encountered two of his old friends. One had been a classmate. The other was a brother of this person who was just a year or two older. When he came back into town, he happened to be walking across the park one day, and he met this, this one brother, and uh, they began talking. He looked a little bit disheveled, not very healthy. Uh, they talked briefly. This man described that his life had kind, kind of awry, that his family had been broken apart, that he'd really become uh, addicted to alcohol. Uh, and as the conversation kind of wound down, he said, but you know, I didn't it couldn't end any other way. My father was an alcoholic. So what else could I have done? Then two or three weeks passed, and he happened to have been in a local restaurant, and he met this man's brother. And the brother uh, was in a very different situation. The, the brother was a successful practicing attorney, uh, had a young family involved in the community, was doing a lot of positive things. And as they got talking, he said, uh, th this, this man said to this brother, um, what do you attribute 
your, your success in life to? And he said, well, I grew up in a family where my father was an alcoholic. I saw what effect that had on the family. I had no other choice. And so you have these two, two boys who grew up in exactly the same circumstance. For one, it led to one outcome. The other, a totally different outcome. Which illustrates what we've been hearing kind of all morning long, and that is, it isn't our, it isn't our experiences or our circumstances or our parents or what school we went to that makes the difference. It's really what we elect to do with it. The third thing I want to talk about is this notion that you hear sometimes that people don't change. I've had lots of people who, when they learn what profession I'm in, they say, oh, well, you know, do you really believe you can change people? Do you really think that people are capable of making change? Um, I want to talk about a, a colleague of mine. And by the way, he has given me permission to, to talk about him. Uh, I'm going to call him Fred. That's not his real name. But 12 years ago, Fred joined our, our company. He's a really brilliant software engineer. He, he managed a small group of people. Uh, and one of the things that became pretty apparent after a year or two is that he was very suspicious. He was really leery of people's motives. He thought there was always something sinister kind of being planned. It was hard for people to collaborate and cooperate and be on a team with him because of these, these traits. His manager kind of sat down with him one day and kind of tried to review this with him and try to pass on this information in a constructive way. And um, he thought the manager was out to get him. He thought it was, this was just one more evidence that the world was really a kind of a hostile, kind of somewhat sinister place. So we decided as a company that we would do um, what we kind of do for some of our client companies. We provided them with what we call a 360-degree feedback process. And I suspect most of you here are familiar with that, but the people who may be out in, in our listening audience, a 360 is simply a questionnaire that asks maybe 50 questions about how a manager behaves. That questionnaire is given to the boss, to the peers, to the subordinates, maybe some other people. Uh, in my case, I give it to my wife, which is a very dangerous thing, by the way. I, I, I later remind that. But this, this is a very po powerful process designed to give people accurate, friendly information about their behavior. He had selected the people who gave him feedback, so they're, you know, he, he couldn't ever accuse this group of being kind of his antagonists. And he received some very consistent, powerful messages. And then he was faced with a really interesting question. Will I reject all this information? Will I kind of deny it? Or will I own it? And fortunately, and to his everlasting credit, he, he owned it. And he said, okay, I can see now that what my boss was telling me was really meant to be helpful. It wasn't meant to, to, to get me. And what people have been saying to me is consistent and it is true. And what I want to repeat to you is that now, seven years later, People talk about the old Fred and the new Fred. And he himself talks about the old Fred and the new Fred. And it's been a, a really um, visual, dramatic example of the fact that people, when they want to, can bring about profound change in how they behave. And I can't tell you what a, a difference it's made to our company, uh, but more importantly, what it's made to him and his family life, um, in his other community activities, it's made an enormous difference. The fourth idea I'd like to share with you is um, an idea that uh, certainly is not unique to me, but often you hear people say, I want to be comfortable. 
You know, life is about making yourself comfortable. Uh, there's been some talk early, early, earlier from earlier speakers about all the brain research that we're receiving now, that our brains are kind of wired fundamentally to do a couple of things. One is to alert us to danger, and secondly, to help us seek out pleasure and positive environments and positive re rewards. And so there's this very kind of built-in mechanism leading us to, to, to seek pleasure. Um, as I reflect on my life, however, I've learned that what, where I have grown, those instances, those events that have caused me to progress and, and, and grow have rather consistently been those that made me uncomfortable. Uh, as I reflected on my life, I thought about the fact that as a college student, some of my colleagues asked me to run for a student body office. I found that very uncomfortable. <laughs> I won, fortunately. Um, I was asked to edit a, a school yearbook in, in high school. Uh, I decided to go back to graduate school when I was married and had three children. Not exactly a comfortable decision. And so as I reflected on my life, I thought, you know, isn't it interesting? Virtually all those times of growth and development have been when I very deliberately made myself uncomfortable. It's when we get outside of our comfort zone that the magic really happens. I worked for a number of years for a pharmaceutical company in Palo Alto. One of my dear colleagues was a man who had come here to, uh, to the United States from, uh, from Europe came from a fairly m modest family. They hadn't, didn't have the money to support him in graduate school here in the United States. And so he had figured out that, that one of the ways he could survive was that a can of dog food was very nutritionally balanced. And that if he would buy a can of dog food and combine it with a fresh piece of fruit, usually a banana, that he could live and be healthy. When he told this story to several of us, he said, there was this one problem. He said, you know, when the professor would call on me in class, I had this urge to bark all of the time. <laughs> and then, he, then he'd laugh, and then he got to laugh. But, you know, I thought about his story, and I've thought about my friends. So I've got friends who are doctors and dentists and lawyers, people who have gone on to, to graduate schools of various kinds. Almost, I think, to a person, they could tell you about the hardships and trials of those years when they were struggling students and what that ultimately meant to them. But it was all about make yourself uncomfortable. And so I guess I would um, just sum up these, these four ideas I've tried to present to you that growth and development, I, I urge you to think of your own life as you look back and say, when have I, when did I grow the most? And I suspect that you will kind of share my conclusion. It wasn't when I was comfortable. It was when I was deliberately uncomfortable. So I would, I would um, ask you just to kind of ponder these, these four ideas that if you can help yourself and the people about you to understand their strengths. Yeah, there are occasions when helping, helping someone to see what they're doing that gets in their way can be useful. But for the great majority of you and for the great bulk of the time, focusing on strengths is so much more valuable. It's if we can avoid this playing victim to say that I am inexorably a product of my past, because that's just not really true. We have a complete choice to make in that. And the third idea about the fact that, yes, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, what stage of life you're in, you can change if you choose to change. Not easy always, but it's very possible. And the final thought, make yourself uncomfortable.
I trust that you will all be able to find one of those ideas that you can relate to your own life. May you do that in a way that brings you even greater happiness and success would be my hope. Thanks. Thank you.